hello everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, depending where you are. So, uh, as Paula introduced me, I'm Sergio Rosendo. I work as a technical specialist in social safeguards within the social equity and rights team at FFI, so the SER team, and we are one of the cross-cutting teams at FFI. Um, Today's uh, webinar is uh, an introduction to social safeguards. So it covers the basics of uh, social safeguards. So it's aimed particularly at those of you with doubt, without much knowledge on social safeguards and who want to know a bit more about social safeguards. If you are already quite familiar with social safeguards, it's fine. I think this is actually very good for, for the group and you can share your experience in the breakout discussions. So um, we can all benefit from your experience on social safeguards. Now, this brings us then to the objectives of this webinar. So uh, hopefully by the end of this webinar, we'll, you'll be able to define what we mean by social safeguards and how they, they differ from safeguarding, which is a related term recognize different kinds of social risks that conservation projects and activities might pose to local communities, list some of the common mechanisms that can help us to avoid and mitigate risks and maximize positive impacts to local communities, and explain why social safeguards are important for organizational resilience. So in this webinar, it will be a mix of presentation where I'll be giving you some information about social safeguards, and also uh, some exercises uh, and group discussions in breakout groups. There will also be some uh, moments, uh, specific moments throughout this, uh, the seminar that I set aside for questions, so question time. So to clarify any questions that you might have. And please feel free to use the chat and uh, put any questions that you might have in the chat. You can also unmute yourself and ask the question um, here uh, in plenary, but if you do that, please wait until the question time, and there will be specific question time with big letters. Question time. So before we move, uh, I would hand you over to Paula, who is going to do a quick poll uh, on basically sort of your perceptions of social safeguards. And this is not really to test your knowledge, it's to give me some understanding of how confident you are with this term, social safeguards. Right, so we've got the results of the poll, which uh, are visible on your screen. Um, but actually just over how half of you actually say that you know a little bit uh, uh, about social safeguards. And actually uh, almost, yeah, almost 70% of you say that you're confident in identifying the social risks of conservation and their mitigation mechanisms. So you are making, this webinar quite difficult for me, quite challenging in terms of actually uh, bringing you something new, but I will try. But this was really, yeah, it was really useful to see. And also these questions are to get you thinking about social safeguards, about do, you, do I really know what social safeguards are? Have I thought about the risks that conservation initiatives might pose to local communities? Do I know what mechanisms I can use to avoid and mitigate these risks? So that's, that's, that was sort of the, the, the point of the poll too. Uh, now, I'm gonna go into the actual webinar and talking about social safeguards. What I'll do is I'll just stop my video uh, just to make sure that the bandwidth is good because last time I had a little bit of problem with, uh, with sort of uh, having sort of a clear connection. My connection here sometimes is not very good. So I'm just gonna kill off my video. I'll put it on again when it's in, in, at question time. So do that and moving on so what are social safeguards um well put simply social safeguards relate to um the impacts our chosen conservation strategies may or do pose to local communities and by association also the measures that we can put in place to avoid and mitigate those risks and impacts so this is broadly what we're talking about and why should we care? Why should we care about social safeguards? Well, um, there are very good reasons why we should care. There are both practical, sorry, 
uh, there, are both, both, there are both ethical and practical reasons why we should care about social safeguards. Um, so on the ethical reasons, respecting and protecting people's rights is a fundamental principle. So social safeguards help us to ensure that people's rights are protected and respected. And on the practical reasons, stakeholder support and ownership are key to successful conservation. So social safeguards help us to ensure that local communities and other stakeholders participate in decisions that affect their lives and well-being. And I would say that it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to have successful conservation without the support of local communities and sustain conservation over the long term without uh, the support of local communities. And what can happen if we don't care about social safeguards? Well, mm, there are also very good reasons <laughs> why we should care about social safeguards. So the risk of doing unintended harm to local communities increases. Conservation might be less effective in the long run without people's support. And there's also serious reputational risks when something does go wrong. And the photo here in this slide shows confrontations between the Mosai people in Tanzania and the government. And here they were protesting against government plans to establish conservation areas in their lands. So imagine if you're a conservation organization working with, Tanz with the Tanzanian government to establish, to establish these uh, conservation areas. Um, well, this sort of issue could severely damage your reputation as a conservation organization in the eyes of the public. And social safeguards would help you to assess the, would have helped you to assess these risks and perhaps do things differently. For example, do, uh, <clears throat> do a, a better consultation process with the Maasai people to avoid these uh, kinds of uh, issues. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. So obviously this is a sort of an extreme case, but just to, to show what can happen when we don't care about social safeguards. And how about this link between social safeguards and organizational resilience? Do you, do you, can you see this link? I mean, um, can you see how social safeguards would help conservation organizations to anticipate issues ahead of time and have processes and mechanisms in place to address those issues? I don't know. If do you see the link? Well, if you don't see the link, hopefully that will be clear um, by the end of this session. Um, so what I would say really, and so the key point here is that um, social safeguards are about good design and well, good project design and procedures. I think this is, social safeguards are part of the right thing to do. They shouldn't be really sort of thought about as an afterthought that you can add to projects, but actually uh, integrated and embedded in project design and procedures. Now, I'm going to give you a more complete definition of what social safeguards comprise, and this is FFI's definition of social safeguards. So, they are comprised of policies and standards, as well as mechanisms and tools that help us to identify risks, uh, i.e. potential negative impacts of our conservations on different groups of people. They also help us to identify, implement, and monitor the effectiveness of measures to avoid, minimize, mitigate, or compensate for negative impacts, and help us also to identify potential positive impacts and how to maximize them. And this is this last point is important because we often think about social safeguards as uh, being about mitigating, avoiding negative risks. So actually, it's also very much about maximizing positive impacts for people. But this is an important point that I like to make. And now moving on, um, you perhaps have heard of the term uh, safeguarding. Well, social safeguards and safeguarding are sometimes used interchangeably, but they're actually uh, different things. So both of them are concerned with respecting and protecting basic human rights, but social safeguards, as I mentioned before, relate to the risks our chosen conservation strategies may or do pose to local stakeholders. Safeguarding, on the other hand, 
relates to the behavior of our partners and staff towards each other and towards local communities. I'm not sure if this is clear, perhaps not, but maybe if we look at some examples, uh, this distin distinction between social safeguards and safeguarding will become clear. And to help clarify this distinction, I'm just going to put an issue in the slide, and I'd like you to think about and tell me if this issue is linked to the need for social safeguards or for safeguarding. So the first issue is stakeholder engagement to ensure rights of local stakeholders are respected. Do you think this is a risk? This is something that is related to the risks of our, our conservation activities might pose to stakeholders, so social safeguards, or to the behavior of our staff and partners, safeguarding. Could you you could type, type on the chat? What do you think? Any any volunteers risking an answer? I can see here that uh, yeah. Safeguards, safeguards, social safeguards. Uh, yeah, I can see, I can see that this group today has heard the social safeguards quite a lot, <laughs> because almost everyone is actually getting it right. It is, uh, it is something that is related to the need for uh, social safeguards. So it's a social safeguards issue. Uh, so stakeholder engagement is one way to minimize risks to stakeholders, for example, the risk of infringing their rights due to lack of participation in decision making. Let's look at uh, another, another issue, sexual harassment, abuse and exploitation. Do you think this is an issue related to social safeguards or to safeguarding? Again, if you like to type on the chat, what do you think? Can see some answers coming up. Ah, guys, really, everyone is getting it right. <laughs> this is great. So everyone really is saying safeguarding, which is, is correct. So this is a typical safeguarding issue. So it's related to the behavior of our staff towards each other and potentially towards community members too. So it is a social safeguarding issue. How about health and safety in the workplace? Would you say this is a social safeguards or safeguarding issue? I can, I'd like to see some answers on the chat there. Safeguarding, 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 safeguarding. Hmm, okay. Very good. So most of you are, are saying that it's uh, that is an issue related to safeguarding. And it's true to a certain extent. And I think this one is a little bit more difficult and it's not always so clear. So many health and safety issues are indeed safeguarding issues because they are about the health and safe, safety of uh, our staff in an organization. But it could also be a social safeguards issue if they were in connection to one of our conservation activities. And I just have a little scenario here for you. Imagine that your organization is supporting oyster farming as an alternative livelihood for women. And women complain that they lack protective gear, so shoes and gloves when they go and harvest oysters. So this can actually become a social safeguards issue because it's in relation to a risk that our conservation activity is posing to these women. So on this one here, it's really depending on the type of issue raised, either social, that can make it either social safeguards or a safeguarding issue but you really sort of spot on on this. Very, very good. So it is a, it can be both. How about this one, resource use access restrictions. So gear bans, creation of no-take areas of fishing, ban on harvesting particular species, social safeguards or safeguarding? 
social safeguards. I see. Right. Right, social safeguards. Yes, you've been doing a lot of work on social safeguards and it is indeed a typical social safeguards issue really and and you see that this will come up quite often resource access restrictions are one of the most common social risks from conservation actions and how about this one exclusion from project activities and opportunities so when someone feels excluded from meetings training livelihood activities etc what do you think this is a social safeguards issue safeguarding Perhaps both. Recording. Hmm? Both. I think, yeah, so in fact, I actually I had it here and I was when I was thinking about this, I, I had it as a social safeguards issue. And it is in most cases, in many cases, a social safeguards issue because it's in relation to your conservation activity. So when people feel that they're excluded from these uh, conservation initiatives, so from meetings, from training, from the benefits of livelihood activities, it is a, a social safeguards issue. But the basis for that discrimination, if it's on the basis of, for example, gender, uh, of disability, et cetera, if that is the, the, you know, the basis for that discrimination of you not participating in a meeting, then it can very easily then also become a safeguarding issue because it is discrimination on the basis of your gender, of your identity, Etc. So those that said both, you are right. Those that said that is a social safeguards issue, they're also right. Again, it sort of depends on the sort of the intricacies of the issue. And just on the just on the last one before we move on, uh, this one on respect or disrespect for people's rights uh, in relation to rangers' activities. Do you think this is a social safeguards or safeguarding issue? So is it in relation to the risks our conservation activities might pose or to the behavior of our staff and partners? So safeguarding, what do you think? Ah, yeah. So I've got here some safeguarding, safeguards, and also some of you who say that it, it depends on the issue at hand. And really, again, here, this one is, is one of these that is actually, it can be both. Uh, and um, so, for example, imagine that your, your project supports law enforcement with rangers. And a ranger apprehends the, the catch of someone fishing and the fisherman complains. So this could be, it is a social safeguards issue because then it's about the risk to the fisherman's livelihoods. But if the ranger was intimidating or harassing someone, this then could be a safeguarding issue. So it's about the behavior of the ranger. So again, kind of there's sort of a gray area here on this one in terms of whether an issue is a safe social safeguards or safeguarding. But again, you have to sort of analyze what is it in relation to? Is it in relation to the, the impact that your project might have, your conservation activity, or to the behavior of one of your staff or one of your partner staff towards each other or towards a member of the community. So this just to get us thinking about these issues of social safeguards and safeguarding. Um, and then just to give you kind of a full list of, uh, of what could be considered safeguarding risks, um, so sexual harassment, abuse, and exploitation, which was one that we looked at, criminal exploitation, modern-day slavery, negligent treatment, physical or emotional abuse, bullying or harassment, health and safety, discrimination on the basis of sex, age, disability, race, etc. 
So this is a, kind of a fuller list of the, uh, safeguarding risks. And on the social safeguards risk, some examples are negative impacts on substantive rights. So these are fundamental rights, such as the right to food, water, cultural practices, et cetera, due to things like involuntary displacement and relocation as a result of creation of protected areas, for example, or resource use access uh, or resource res use restrictions. And also on the social safeguards risks, we've got uh, negative impacts on procedural rights. So this thing of procedural rights is the means through which your fundamental rights are achieved. And these are things like access to information, participation in decision-making, and access to justice. So just to give you sort of an idea of sort of this full list of what can be considered social safeguarding, safeguarding risks and social safeguards risks. And a point that I really would like to make is that uh, these two these two areas, social safeguards and social safeguarding, are related. And the important thing is that uh, it's important to have mechanisms in place to address them. However, they are addressed by different policies and channels within organizations. And I'm just going to give you some examples from FFI how these different issues related to social safeguards and safeguarding are addressed within FFI. And the first one is a social a safeguarding example, so sexual harassment, abuse, and exploitation. At FFI, this is covered under uh, our policy and procedure on safeguarding children and adults at risk. And the way it's addressed is on the first instance, by reporting to local safeguards, guarding focal points, and then these issues can also be escalated higher to a safeguarding officer and a safeguarding lead at the FF, at FFI in, in Cambridge. Now, another example, and this is an example of a social safeguards issues, so stakeholder participation in project design and implementation. So this falls under FFI's position and guidance on stakeholder engagement. And this would be dealt with and promoted through a stakeholder engagement plan uh, and as if relevant, a free prior and informed consent process. Another example, this one of bullying and harassment. This is a, social, a safeguarding issue. So this is covered by FFI's anti-bullying and anti-harassment policy. And the way it's dealt with, there's an internal procedure, an internal grievance procedure at FFI that deals with these issues that takes them, reports them to a line manager, and then they also might be escalated to HR if uh, they can't be dealt with through sort of uh, uh, discussions when you line manager. And finally, just an example of resource access restrictions, and this is a social safeguards issues. Uh, this is covered by FFI's position on displacement and restrictions on access to resources. And the way we deal with this uh, and trying to deal with this in a more systematic way is through a mitigation plan and grievance mechanism at the project or program level. So just a few examples from FFI, it will be different in different organizations, uh, but just to see that these issues are important, but the the, they are addressed by different policies and by different channels and mechanisms. Great. So this brings us to question time. So this is uh, it's time for uh, uh, addressing some some questions that you might have. I'm just going to look at the at the chat uh, to see if uh, if if there are some questions. And there are some questions here. Ikli, um, Ikli has a question. Why is it important to dive, differentiate between social safeguards and safeguarding? I think the point here that we're trying to, to, to make is that social safeguards and safeguarding are often used interchangeably in, in, sort of in, in, in conservation, but they're different issues. Uh, and the important, be, the important point being that organizations need to have 
policies and processes in place to address these different kinds of issues. But the types of so the, the issues related to social safeguards are the kinds of issues that are more at the operational level of projects that are to do with the way projects are implemented and the potential risks that those projects might pose to local communities. So they often come sort of within the sort of the, the, the same context, but it is important to differentiate them and to channel them through different mechanisms. Thank you, Claire. Any other questions? Now, because it's question time, you can actually unmute yourself and ask the question directly. You can do so in Spanish, Portuguese, or, or English. Um, any other languages? From, uh, this I wouldn't be able to help. Maybe some of the others could. Uh, but yeah, please do. Please feel free. Or putting them on the chat. Right. Sir, it looks like some people have their hands up. Simba does. I can't see. I can't see the hands up, unfortunately. Um, maybe can, they can just, yeah, just pose the question. Get ahead. Yeah, Simba, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um. Uh. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Um. I. I just wanted to find out. Um. Do you think uh, this is something that you can uh, mainstream into smaller organizations? Uh, it sounds like it's something that probably needs someone with a lot of experience uh, and probably dedicated to that. But is it something that smaller organizations can also uh, mainstream into their activities? Yeah, thank you. Mm, thank you, Simba, for this question. I think it's a really relevant question. Um, we are trying to mainstream social safeguards uh, within FFI and recognizing that FFI is a big organization, perhaps with much more resources than local organizations. And this is challenging. I'm not going to say uh, that it's an easy process. So I think for smaller organizations, it also presents quite, quite a lot of challenges. But there are things that you, we can do to start mainstreaming these sort of processes in organizations, in small organizations, in the way that we design our activities, in the way that we implement our activities. And, you know, training capacity building, it's one of the ways that we can do that. At FFI, we work closely with partners and, and, and sort of trying to share our, the sort of our learning with, with partners and to also share the things that we use with partners. So I think there is scope for uh, for smaller organizations also to adopt these um, these uh, uh, these mechanisms, but I'm not going to say it's not challenging because it, it is, um, and it is even challenging for larger organizations. I think I'm going to move on. Just... Uh, we just, sorry, oh, we... Sergio, yeah, one quick absolutely. question from Rosemary. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's more, more than a question, just a comment that uh, we we're just going through that. I mean, I, here in Colombia, you know, we do have laws, labor laws and human, uh, you know, development laws. And you kind of, as an organization, focus on complying with those laws, but they're usually focused on the welfare of your staff. Like mm -hmm. you need to provide, you know, health and insurance and workers' compensation. And you focus on that, but you underestimate the impact of your activities beyond uh, what you do. So you're protecting the forest, you're saving a species, but uh, you don't realize that that has the opposite effect on certain populations that are not involved with your work. And uh, we were required by one of our funders to put together a safe garden. Now I understand the difference here. So thanks so much for bringing it up. So safe garden policy. And uh, under our experience, everything that we put on that, it, it was like, obvious but you don't realize that you need to write it down and make sure your staff is aware that mm -hmm. if you see anything related to human rights happening in your context with the students that you teach with the farmers that you work with you need to be aware of that in a report because it's uh, directly sometimes and indirectly sometimes a result of your work 
but we're mm. very used to look at inside our organizations and making sure everything works well and based on you know laws and common sense so uh to to just to re uh, reply a little to simba's uh, question just to just to, if you we used the model from another organization to understand what the policy was and now we're in the process of sharing it with the team and making our team aware that all of this needs to be in our minds when we're doing our work every day so you know it's it's it cannot i mean it's the issue is complicated you're putting yeah. a policy together not so much because you kind of write it down or use somebody else's format and adapt it to your organization and share it with your team but the issues i mean when things happen is when it's really hard which i guess that's what you're going to talk about now Sarah, here with regards to risk management and so yeah. on how to prevent and tackle that right yeah Thanks. No, no, yeah, i just I, wanted to share that yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that contribution. I I totally agree, and I couldn't have put put it better. I mean, your words really sort of portray exactly the sort of issues that we're sort of dealing with, um, sort of on 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 every on the every everyday level. So thank you for that. I think there are more questions, and we, maybe we can leave some of these questions to actually debate them in the breakout groups. I just want sort of to move on, so we uh, so we make progress through throughout the, the webinar. But please, any questions that you might have, note them down. We'll be able, we still have, we'll have, we'll be having two breakout groups and there's scope within each of those groups to discuss some of these questions. So let me just then mute my video again and so carry on. Um, before I, I proceed into sort of giving you some idea of the main categories of risks, social risks and impacts, I just want to give you a sort of hopefully a very just brief overview of how these um, um, issue of social safeguards has evolved. So um, the, um, the concern about the social risks and impacts of, of projects started during uh, the 1990s in the development sector in response to criticism over the negative impact of large-scale donor-funded project, donor-funded development projects, uh, for example, dams, roads, etc., uh, mainly funded by the World Bank but also other uh, multilateral organizations, that has resulted in uh, in these organizations really thinking about the adoption of strict environmental and social standards. Um, the World Bank and the International Financial Corporation being one of them. And some of these projects, I remember one in the 1990s in Brazil called Paul Morwest, which was funded by the World Bank, which had terrible uh, effects on, on, on the environment, causing deforestation, but also uh, on the encroachment of indigenous lands and also the, the, the lands and forests of traditional people. So a lot of criticism uh, around that, leading the the multilateral uh, development banks, the World Bank in particular, to actually seriously take into consideration uh, and adopting strict environmental and social safeguards, which are the basis of what we now talk about as being uh, social safeguards. And these have been also adopted by environmental funds like the Global Environmental Facility, the Blue Action Fund, uh, they've also become part of market-based mechanisms to conservation, like Red Plus, Plan Vivo, and other uh, PES, Payment for Ecosystem Service Approaches. And they've been adopted by um, large conservation NGOs, uh, IUCN, WWF, uh, Conservation International, as well as ourselves at FFI. And partly, but not only, in response to funding funders' requirements for social safeguards in our projects. And I say not only because at FFI and also in other organizations, this drive for social safeguards is also about the drive of uh, implementing and promoting rights-based approaches to conservation, so approaches that promote and respect uh, human rights, which are principles that we are committed to respecting and promoting within our projects. Um, some of you perhaps have had experiences on these donor requirements of social safeguards. Uh, hold your thoughts. We might we can discuss them in uh, in the uh, in the breakout groups. But what the point that I want to make is that the concern 
uh, with social safeguards and the drive for social safeguards initially started as a largely a defensive approach. So in response to public criticism of development projects, but it, it has since be, uh, been framed in a much more positive way. So a way to support effective and equitable biodiversity conservation. So again, I just want to iterate this, uh, what I said before, that social safeguards is actually about good project design and good project procedures. Um, now, what I'd like to do is go through some, uh, uh, some of the typical risks and impacts which can arise during conservation projects. Um, and just to sort of give you just a brief overview of these categories of risks and impacts, social risks and impacts, which we then can discuss a bit more on the breakout groups on how these sort of apply and what you've seen in your experience in implementing your projects. And the first one is resource use and access restrictions. So this is a major one in the places that we work. Uh, so restrictions on people's access and use of resources, for example, the resources that are important for their livelihoods. Um, and this has been an issue uh, with uh, protected areas established by the government uh, where people have not been consulted and lost access to land and resources. But it can also occur in more bottom-up community-led initiatives. So when, for example, not all groups within communities have been consulted in relation to a particular conservation issue, for example, um, uh, a, a, an area, a co-managed area with certain rules and regulations, even if it's community-led. And I'm going to invite you just to start thinking about the, the, uh, how, how these issues have come up uh, in the projects that you've been involved. So issues to do with resource use and access restrictions. Um, another category of risks and impacts are risks and impacts related to indigenous peoples, ethnic minorities, and local communities in general. So the, the projects that we implement will have different impacts on these communities, particularly important to consider in indigenous communities and indigenous peoples because they are often the most disadvantaged and marginalized in society. So special attention needs to be given to these communities to ensure that their rights are protected and respected. Uh, another category of risks are related to law enforcement and patrols. And this, of course, doesn't apply to all projects. Not all projects support rangers and law enforcement. But uh, these sorts of risks can relate both to the conduct of rangers towards local communities, for example, how they treat people if they are captured poaching protected species, um, you can't just treat people and you know infringe their human rights. Although you have the right, obviously, to apprehend things according to law, these are illegal activities. But this needs to be done in a certain way. Uh, but also, it also includes the conditions in which rangers work, so their personal safety. And we know that in many in in, in many contexts, rangers are also at risk doing their work. So these, types, these are the types of risks and impacts that are related to law enforcement that commonly occur in projects that do support law enforcement. And a fourth category of risk is issues to do with gender. Um, and gender, of course, is about men and women. So it's not only about women. Uh, but women are very often the most disadvantaged and marginalized groups in many contexts, and it's particularly important to ensure that projects don't make their situation worse. And this photo here is actually a very interesting uh, photo that illustrates gender issues in conservation. This, this is a photo of mosquito net fishers in Mozambique. Um, and uh, there's Oh, there's been efforts to establish co-management in, in Mozambique, sort of community-led initiatives uh, based on, on fishers committees. But the issue is often that the fishers committees that are dominated mostly by men with little participation from women, uh, one of their first targets in terms of, of, of conservation and sort of establishing resource use rules is banning mosquito net fishing 
often without consulting women, uh, and also without the provision of alternatives uh, to mosquito net fishing to women. Mosquito net fishing is very important for women's income and for, uh, uh, and for food. So these sort of conservation in initiatives, resource use management initiatives, though they are sort of at the community level, they often have forgotten the special needs of women fishers. Um, so you see that there's these sort of different categories of social risks and impacts. They're not the only ones, but they summarize more or less uh, what we're dealing with and the sort of things that we have to take into account when we're thinking about the design of projects, the implementation of projects. Um, and as it was said before, sometimes we, we are concerned about uh, issues internally within the organization of complying with policies, et cetera, but we forgot, forget what the impacts of our conservation initiatives might be outside the organization with the local communities that we work with. So this brings me to uh, new question time, but I think uh, because we, we don't have a lot of time, I would go into the group work actually, uh, which is to discuss some of the issues that we've been talking about. Are we all back from our groups? We are. Great. How did you get on when you in your groups? Good. Great. So I, I had the chance of going into some of the groups, sort of sitting there in the back silently, uh, but just listening into the conversation. And there were some really animated discussion, uh, really good stuff, mm -hmm. um, really good stuff on how these uh, risks and these areas of risks play out in your countries. I had some experiences from Colombia, from Nicaragua, really, really interesting. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, we had thought of asking you to report back uh, on the group discussion, but we don't really have time for that. So what I would do is I would invite you to have a look at the jam boards of the at the uh, at the group work of the other other groups, uh, which is there. If someone is sort of dying to make a comment or ask a question before we move on to looking at how we could address some of these risks and the types of tools and mechanisms that we could use, please do so now. Unmute yourselves um, and share share with us. I can try to share from our group, Sergio. Great. Uh, Tell me, thanks. Yeah, please do. In my group, it was uh, Rosa Mira from Colombia, Ronald from Nicaragua, and also Juliana from Rainforest Trust. Um, and we talked a little bit about like uh, having some uh, awareness of like before you, how to involve people in a way that's culturally sensitive to their norms. Um, so to not like violate trust or uh, to try to, of course, involve as many people in the community as you can but through a way that is inviting to them and not creating tension among them as well. Um, and then we talked a little bit about like uh, that sometimes because people might not receive the benefits of a protected area, for example, um, they to them, it is a direct like, conflict to their own well-being. And so it often creates like a system of, sometimes we were talking about like, uh, reporting on your own community members or family members for a legal activity mm -hmm. that then can create uh, tensions between uh, violations of family members and like loyalty to either a conservation effort over your own family, things like that. Um, so we talked a little bit about how like complicated it is because it's all related often to people's like initial uh, situation to if they're in a situation of poverty and they're not gaining access to resources in a legal way, then it's part of their survival, I think, to take illegal measures. And so to try to be cognizant of all that when you're like uh, creating either consequences or like legal boundaries about how we react to those, uh, I don't know, very sensitive uh, violations of illegal activity or something. You know? Yeah, it's 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 really yeah, it's really challenging when you trying to deal with illegal activities, isn't it? I mean, people are doing these illegal activities, but um, again, they are doing them for a reason. Uh, very often, for you know, for necessity. 
um, how you go about uh, dealing with these issues in a way that you don't sort of, uh, if you ban those issues, you, those practices that you're going to compensate for loss of livelihood, but if you're going to compensate, well, it's an illegal activity, isn't that going to provide incentives for other people to start doing these illegal activities to actually get compensated or participate in, in alternative livelihood? So it's, it's challenging. It's, it's very challenging. So I, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Tom. I think uh, I'm sure there's lots lots of other things that could just spend the, the rest of the afternoon talking. What I'll do is I'll I'll go to the to the sort of next part of the webinar, which is to talk about some of the mechanisms that we can use, or at least that we have been uh, trying to use at FFI to identify and to address some of the key risks of, of uh, and impacts of conservation. So I was going to quickly share again my my screen. You can, great, yeah, fantastic. So we talked about these main risk, uh, social risk uh, and impact categories. We uh, talked about how um, we can identify those risks, uh, et cetera. So I think now, what I'd like to do is talking about uh, what mechanisms and, and tools there are to manage the social risks and impacts of conservation. Um, and I'm going to talk about tools that we've been using at FFI and we are actually trying to roll out at FFI. And I know that a lot of you in your in your day-to-day -day work, you already dealing with these risks and obviously you're doing something, you are identifying them and you're dealing with them. And that's not different FFI. We've been also doing that for a long time. But uh, what we're trying to do with these different mechanisms and tools is to actually adopt a more systematic and consistent approach to the identification and mitigation of social risks in conservation. So that is not just kind of an, an ad hoc process, but it's actually embedded in, in what we do. And there's so a number of these different tools. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about each of these, just give a little bit, uh, a little brief description of what they are, and also talk about where we can use them within the project cycle, because I think it's, it's easier to sort of see their potential if we uh, relate them to the project cycle. And the project cycle that I'm using here is kind of a very generic project cycle. So it's from defining the problem to designing uh, aims, objectives, activities, and the monitoring plan to implementing the project, your activities, monitoring, uh, monitoring plan implementation and adapting if necessary, and then evaluating and sharing sharing lessons. So that's sort of a, a generic project cycle. Um, I know that not everything sort of goes and fits within this project cycle, uh, but at least just for purposes of trying to sort of, uh, uh, sort of present these tools, I think it'll, it will be useful. Um, also just going to say that this part of the presentation might be a little bit presentation heavy. <laughs> Uh, and I don't have nice pictures to illustrate, uh, but uh, I think you, you can relate a lot of these things to, to, to what you do. So the first, the first uh, uh, um, mechanism that I'd like to talk about is a risk screening or categorization. Uh, and this is a high level risk assessment that uh, that helps to identify key risks. The social safeguards need to address needed to address those risks and their level of complexity. So think about this risk screening as sort of some sort of questionnaire that you do, that you would do, uh, that sort of takes you through different sort of steps and categories of risk and guides you through thinking what which of these risks apply to the kind of conservation intervention that you are thinking of or of, of, of implementing. So where do you think this, this uh, tool, uh, where would you use this tool? Where in the project cycle would you use this tool? You can write on the chat. What do you think? I think this is probably one of the very obvious ones. 
where would you use a risk screening to try to identify the key risks of your project and also the types of social safeguards that you would need to 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 address those risks just check the chat okay right anyone else so I'm seeing here the fine and design. So the stages, the stages one and two. Great. Anyone else? Yeah, I think I think that there is there is an unanimity. You <laughs> get yeah one and two. So indeed, I think this the uh, the the risk screening is is most relevant uh, to the at uh, the definition. Uh, and design stages. So when you're preparing your concept note and your project proposal, so this is where you define the vision for what you want to achieve, identify you, your your stakeholders, uh, you do your theory of change, you design your goals, objectives, and management plan. So the, the screening will help you here to identify what are the key risks and impacts resulting from your proposed activities and the safeguards needed to address those impacts. So you can integrate these mechanisms, these social safeguards mechanisms that you, you see as necessary to mitigate those risks in your planned activities, and also to allocate budget to those, to those, uh, to those processes, to those tools, because they don't come, often they don't come without a cost. So it's important to think about, when you're thinking about uh, of social safeguards to actually include those social safeguards in your budgeting, for example, in terms of staff that is needed to look at that in terms of, you know, how many uh, stakeholder engagement meetings you need to do, et cetera, to implement your stakeholder engagement plan, et cetera. So uh, budgeting is is quite, quite important. Just want to add one note about about the tools and guidance that we are at FFI developing in terms of risk screening. We're developing a, a what we call a social safeguards screening tool. We don't want to call it risk screening because it's a, it sounds a little bit negative. So instead, we actually talk about, we call it the social safeguards screening tool and putting the emphasis that this is actually to select the kinds of mechanisms that you need to have in your project to ensure that you have that you maximize positive impacts uh, for people uh, while minimizing risks. Um, so the next one, uh, the next mechanism that we are we have used in our projects at FFI is social impact uh, assessment. And social impact assessment is uh, a means to assess the potential impact on different groups within local communities bef before an intervention. For example, before your project starts, or to measure actual impact, um, sort of towards more towards the end project end uh, of your intervention. So as part of your monitoring and evaluation and learning. Again, I think here it's this this description is is quite obvious where where you would use a social impact assessment. Um, you can write on the chat, but. It, 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 it's, it's a little bit obvious, but anyway, it's what I, it's most, most relevant to at kind of the, between the design and the implementation phases, uh, uh, before you do your, your when, when you, before you start implementing your, your, your project. And this will also provide you with a baseline to actually measure impact of your interventions. So a social impact assessment uh, is often also part of your baseline assessment. And then again, at, towards the end is part of your, uh, of measuring actual impact. So at these two moments of, of the project, so between design and implementation, and when you are monitoring, evaluating and sharing lessons. At FFI, we've been using some tools and we have guidance on some of these tools, both for this ex ante, so before the project uh, and also after. So we've got guidance on social impact assessment. Uh, so this is before project starts. 
And we also have guidance on part three impact assessment. And this is to evaluate the impacts of a project as the name obviously indicates. Um, so after project ends. Um, specifically for protected areas, we've been using uh, what is called, it's a tool that's called Social Assessment for Protected Areas, SAPA. It's a tool that was developed by the IED, the uh, International Institute for Environment and Development. Uh, we've been using it in, mostly in our projects in Africa uh, to evaluate the impact of protected areas, but we're also thinking of uh, adapting and transferring it to uh, other contexts. Um, another important tool that we are rolling out across uh, our portfolio of projects is a stakeholder engagement plan. And this one you might be familiar with. Uh, it's, uh, it aims to identify and categorize stakeholders, uh, plan stakeholder engagement actions, for example, in terms of sharing information about the project, consultation, uh, ensuring participation uh, in, in decisions that affect sort of the people concerned, pre prior and informed consent, FPIC, which is very important uh, in, in projects that affect the rights of communities or groups to resources. And very important, the stakeholder engagement plan is, is essential to document uh, those actions. Um, where do you think, uh, what stages of the project cycle, stage of the project cycle, do you think you would use a stakeholder engagement plan? Are there particular stages that it's most relevant to? What do you think? Anyone want to risk a sharing a their views on the stakeholder engagement plan and where in the project cycle you would use it? All. Oh. Yeah, so I've got between three and three. Okay. It's interesting. So we, some of you say all, some of you are leaning towards two, three, and four. Again, here, someone was actually saying all of them. And I think you, yeah, you, you're right. I think you, 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 you're getting it. So a stakeholder engagement plan is relevant across the project cycle. So um, the stakeholder engagement plan is a continuous process, isn't it? It's starting starting from with involving stakeholders in the design of the project throughout to through to its implementation, monitoring, evaluation, and sharing lessons. So very very often what you do is you do your sort of preliminary stakeholder engagement plan, your initial stakeholder engagement plan to guide uh, your engagement with uh, stakeholders in the design stage. And then you continuously update that uh, stakeholder engagement plan as you move through the project cycle, as you move towards implementation, monitoring and, and evaluation. So it's sort of a continuous project and it's relevant at different stages of the project cycle. Um, so, yeah, just to, sh to show you that really sort of the design, implementation, and monitoring plan uh, stages, but also feeding into the lessons learned. Uh, so the lessons learned in terms of engagement, engagement with stakeholders, what lessons you've learned that can be useful then for future projects. Some of the tools and guidance that we have at FFI, uh, we have a uh, guidance on stakeholder engagement that takes you through the steps of stakeholder mapping, stakeholder analysis, and actually putting together a stakeholder engagement plan, which is useful. It's, it's, it's available. So if you, if you are interested in using this tool, perhaps you're already using it and you want another, another sort of model to use to compare, it's available. We also have an introduction to stakeholder engagement, an online course, uh, and this is available to everyone on the Capacity for Conservation website. 
uh, and it's a really nice course. It's sort of very interactive with with nice interactive exercises that again take you through the steps of uh, stakeholder identification, stakeholder analysis, um, and then there in the in the actual course that provides you with some links to uh, the guidance on and and the tools for the actually to to prepare a stakeholder engagement plan. Um, another very important um, tool instrument for mitigating impacts of, of social impacts, particularly, and this one focused on access restrictions, and we talked quite a bit about access restrictions, is a mitigation plan. Uh, and this is uh, to help us plan measures aimed at avoiding, minimizing, or compensating for the potential negative impacts of access restrictions on the groups of affected, so different groups within communities, and to monitor the implementation of those measures. So this mitigation plan, also known as a process framework, for those of you who are involved in this uh, large internationally funded uh, conservation projects, for example, uh, funded by BAF or IUCN, you've probably been asked to prepare a process framework for mitigation of access restrictions. Uh, in terms of where would you use this in the project cycle, where do you think this is most, uh, most useful, let's say? Anyone? Design stage, maybe? Implementation? Monitoring and evaluation? Or is this, this or is this one the, of the ones that sort of cut across many of many many years of project cycle. So I see that there, yeah, there's unanimity for two design. So some of you are saying three and five, so implementation and uh, monitoring. Yeah. I think uh, the mitigation plan is is obviously really important at the design the design stage. Um, no doubt about that. And, and, and I'm going to try to explain you why, why this is the case. Um, so so at, the, at the design stage, if you start thinking about risks and impacts, you may be able to design your conservation activities in ways that avoid some of those negative impacts and maximize positive impacts. So at the design stage, you're still in time to consider different design options that try to avoid uh, negative impacts. For example, let's say if you're designing a marine protected area, you can think about sort of ways that you can minimize negative impacts. For example, instead of having uh, only no-take zones, as the main sort of management measure, you might have you might want to have zones that where people are allowed to fish for uh, for for a specific season, fish with specific gears, or rot rot rotating areas, rotating conservation areas that are closed and open. So you're still in time here to actually consider different design options that uh, that mitigate some of the risks that. Uh, that you that the conserva conservation can have on local communities. And for those risks that are unavoidable, you can start you can think about what kind of mitigation measures you need. And these mitigation measures be, might be things like livelihood support actions. Um, and you might you might start with a preliminary kind of mitigation plan and uh, this is what happens again in this uh, uh, projects funded, say, by the Blue Action Fund, is that they ask you to design a preliminary uh, mitigation plan uh, with sort of just the principles of how you're going to mitigate and how you try to avoid uh, uh, negative impacts at the design stage, and then uh, ask you to do a uh, interim mitigation plan and then a final mitigation plan. 
So the, again, this is relevant across the project cycle, uh, particularly at the design and implementation. At, and then again, also this one will provide you some lessons uh, that you know that you 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 can you can share uh, in terms of learning of what worked and what didn't work in terms of mitigation these mitigating negative impacts on livelihoods. In terms of tools and guidance that we have at FFI, we've got uh, guidance on displacement and restrictions on access to resources. I must say that this is a little bit outdated and we are working on updating this it, that to bring it in line with more current thinking on, uh, on, on, on mitigation of access restrictions, particularly to make our processes more, let's say, in line with what, say, Blue Action Fund and other funders are increasingly requiring. So we, we will be updating this. Um, the next, the next tool I'd like to talk about is a grievance mechanism. This one you might have also heard about. It's, uh, it's increasingly required, again, by funders. And this is a means to provide local communities and stakeholders uh, with a way of raising complaints, concerns, and questions that they might have with regards to projects. Um, again, I just ask you, where do you think this you would use this? Where, it's, where would it be more relevant? it at the design stage, implementation stage? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, okay. yep. One to five, all of them, yeah. I think with a lot of these, I think there is a there, a pattern is emerging here, isn't it? I mean, uh, it, it's a lot of these mechanisms. They are uh, they are relevant across uh, different stages of the project cycle, but but specifically sometimes um, to certain ones in particular. So in the grievance mechanism is one one example. It's uh, it's also a continuous process. You have to think about it when you're sort of designing the project, but particularly it's, it is used during the implementation phase. It's a, it, it's a way that you, you deal with any concerns or complaints that local communities might have in relation to your conserva you know, conservation actions, to the negative impacts of your conservation actions. And this is not to say that the grievance mechanism is the only way that you can deal with these concerns. I think, a grievance mechanism is perhaps the, the mechanism of last resort when there are these problems. Uh, I mean, typically, if you are been working with stakeholders, if you have a good relationship with your local stakeholders, these issues, these, these potential problems, things that are not going so well, these will be picked up in your meetings with local communities and they'll, they will be solved within sort of the everyday uh, operation of a project. When things are get a little bit more serious, or depending on the nature of the issue, then you need to provide a means for uh, local communities to take these uh, issues to to something that is sort of uh, above, and that they there is sort of a, a predictable process to deal with this. Um, so this is obviously more most relevant, like I said, at the implementation stage but also feeds into the monitoring and evaluation uh, of your project. So if you pick up these issues soon enough, you'll be able to perhaps adapt your, your activities in a way that addresses these issues and, uh, and makes and, and these issues that do not recur. And it provides lessons that you can think, well, how can I avoid these shortcomings in the future? So it's very good. And the good thing about the grievance mechanism is that it's also it 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 uh, documents the process. It documents the type of grievance. It documents how it was handled. So in in a kind of a transparent way. So it's possible for you to go back to and say, okay, this issue, this is how it was dealt with. And if things do go very wrong, you are able to say, okay, we did this, we did this, we did this. this is how we approach the the issue. So it's transparent to everyone. Um, 
at FFI, we've got uh, a grievance mechanism guidance uh, that projects are using to develop their grievance mechanisms. Uh, the challenge here is that depending on on the on on, on funders that require this mechanism, uh, sometimes they have different different guidance that we have to reconcile with our guidance. Uh, but in terms of the principles, they are they more or less align themselves. And what we're trying to do now is we're trying to uh, to roll out a grievance mechanism across all our projects so that all our projects have a grievance mechanism in place. When I say projects, sometimes is not an individual project, sometimes is a program, so uh, a, a group of projects that are operating on in a landscape, for example. So a grievance mechanism can uh, be implemented at the project level, but preferably at the landscape level. So there is one grievance mechanism that can deal with uh, with potential problems at that scale, at that broader scale. Um, and uh, another very important uh, uh, tool is a gender analysis and action plan. And I was hearing uh, in some of the groups that we were talking quite a lot about uh, gender issues, working with men and, and women. And uh, a gender analysis and action plan helps you to understand gender differences. So, so how women and men access resources differently. Uh, their different abilities to participate in decision making. And with this information, you can uh, plan priority actions to respond to any gender related risks and opportunities. Um, in terms of where in the project cycle you'd use a gender analysis to help you address gender issues, any ideas? Do you think this again? This is one of those that uh, can be used at different stages. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's. I mean, you're right. I mean, it is relevant across across the entire project cycle, but particularly the design and implementation stages. So it really helps you to understand uh, gender difference, differences, um, uh, what impacts on women, women, men and women are likely to be. And for example, if you're planning, say, uh, if, if your conservation initiative, you're planning a ban on harvesting a particular resource, um, how is this going to impact on women? I mean, sometimes that resource might be harvested from by men, and women might not be directly involved in the har harvesting of that resource, but they they might participate and be dependent on that resource in some other way, say through involvement in processing that resource or selling it. So, uh, it's 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 very important to understand how a certain intervention is going to impact men and women. Uh, differently, and also to understand, for example, barriers to women's participation. For example, women might not always speak out in meetings where uh, they're also men, uh, so you might want to think about so how are we going to uh, enable women to speak uh, their opinions, perhaps by organizing uh, meetings of men and women separately, etc. So a gender action plan, a gender analysis and action plan will help you sort of understand these details on how men uh, on on how projects might affect men and women differently, and how you can actually what kind of actions you can take to promote sort of more uh, gender gender equitable project outcomes, let's say. And just to say also in terms of what our guidance is on gender analysis and action planning, sorry, just the project cycle here. Um, we are developing guidance on, we have guidance on integrating gender and impacts, and this is available. Uh, this is a really nice guidance. It's, it's, it's not very long, but it provide you with, provides you with sort of key points 
on on issues that you need to take into consideration when you think about gender and uh, when you're designing a project. Uh, we're also developing uh, a, a gender analysis and action planning guidance, which is currently in preparation, and also an introduction to gender in conservation as an online course. So a few resources here that will be available for FFI and, and also for FFI partners. And finally, I want to talk about this final mechanism, which is to do with law enforcement, which is a code of conduct and standard operation procedures for rangers. So uh, this is a so these are tools that help to support rangers' work, avoid human rights violations, and secure both rangers and communities' welfare and safety. Of course, it applies to projects where there is law enforcement by rangers. Um, it's a code, a code of conduct is is about the principles that rangers must follow, whereas a standard operation procedures are how those principles are actually applied in practice when rangers are doing their work. Uh, and this is particularly relevant for uh, the implementation of project activities, but it's also important to think in terms of uh, updating these standard operation procedures uh, as they are implemented through monitoring and adapting because you might see, you might realize that some things don't work and you need to fine tune them. Um, so it also generates lessons then for, uh, for, for future projects in terms of how you um, work with rangers, how you ensure that rangers, uh, 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 rangers work conforms with uh, human rights uh, uh, commitments and also how you ensure that uh, range of welfare is actually protected as well, because that is also important. Uh, in terms of the, oh, sorry, in terms of the tools and guidance that we have uh, at FFI, we uh, we work with uh, the International Ranger Federation and the Universal Ranger Support Alliance. Uh, they develop a code of conduct for rangers, which uh, we use and adapt in some of our projects. But this will depend very much on the context because in some countries, some countries already have their own codes of conduct. Uh, so this will be bring in when there isn't a code of conduct uh, and when there's the ne necessity to develop one. And the URSA code of conduct is one that conforms to uh, good practice and international standards. So it's a really good one to have as a model that then you can adapt to, 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 uh, to, to the context, to the local context. Um, so in terms of these tools, I know it was a lot to take in, quite a lot of talking. It's a listing of different things. And like I said, these are some of the tools and mechanisms that we try to roll out in FFI. Um, so uh, things that we're developing resources for, these resources will be available for our work, for our work with, with partners. So you probably will be hearing more about these uh, in, the, in, the, in the near future as we implement our projects. Um, what I'd like to do now is if you've got any, I'm just looking at the time here to see if we, how we're doing with time. Um, I think we're running a little bit of, out of time. Um, so I think what we could do is we could go into the exercise, which is, uh, again, going into breakout groups, uh, where I'd really like you to share your experiences about some of these mechanisms. So have you used any of these mechanisms? Are you planning to use um, these mechanisms? What drives you to use these mechanisms? Is it because you're participating in projects that require these mechanisms? Or is it because this is you recognize this, this is something important that you should have in place? And again, from your own experiences of using these mechanisms, what you think are the challenges to developing and implement, implementing these social safeguards in practice? And I would love to join your discussions because at FFI, we also have many challenges, but we also see that there's lot of, lots of good opportunities to use these mechanisms. So Chloe, do you think we have the time to do the breakout rooms? Or we can have a, the other option is that, that we just have a free discussion here now before we close.
get to the end. Yeah, I wonder if we just have free discussion and then any, anyone who's comfortable um, can speak up or ask any questions. Yeah, we have about 12 minutes left before we close. Uh, which is too little, really, to go into the breakout groups, isn't it? I wonder if just stop sharing, Sergio. I've put yeah. the questions in the chat and we'll see mm -hmm. if any more start on mute and ask questions or respond to the exercise. Yeah, always. So the questions are in the chat. Um, and also sort of, yeah, just the list of the tools that we that I've, I spoke about. Any experience in using any of these? Um, any of you have prepared a stakeholder engagement plan, for example, or a grievance mechanism? I think generally, it's Augustine, Dominic, from St. Lucia. I guess that I've just started working with trust over the last year. Um, these are generally new to me. I mean, the one that is is most familiar is the um, stakeholder engagement plan. I, I think it's it's critical when you dealing with with um, projects that it, that really must all projects have stakeholders, but there's somewhere it's 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 um, when you're dealing in at the community level that you you must have a, a an engagement and a stakeholder engagement plan that that um, ensures that that you have regular interaction with your stakeholders so that that at all points during 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 your implementation your design and implementation that you have you have taken into consideration the views of stakeholders because if if that doesn't happen there will definitely come a point in in, in your project cycle where you will have challenges responding to some of the issues that will Come up and, and usually um, one of the, the most frequent ones is that the stakeholders say they don't know they were not aware mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so that, that's 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 kind of my experience but i find that um as 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 some of the projects become more challenging in terms of implementation it's important the new tools that are being presented here i think will will facilitate um, improved implementation rates for for projects, not 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 just rate, but um, results, improved results, in results with project implement, implementation. Thanks, Augustine. Uh, can I, can I just ask, uh, in terms of 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 um, of uh, the the re the requirements in terms of time for your staff for to dedicate to preparing a stakeholder engagement plan and making sure that it's updated, that the interactions with stakeholders are well documented. How, how have you find that, found that? Do you think it, it adds a lot of, of work burden to, to what yeah. you're already doing, which, yeah. is pro, which is always already a lot, and yeah. how you deal with that? You're asking a question to a, a resource for agency. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we we don't have we don't have. I mean, COVID COVID dealt a, a real debilitating blow to to us in terms of the trust had to to. Um, we're just beginning to get back to normal in terms of, of mm -hmm. our staffing okay. levels, and, mm -hmm. and and that's a challenge. I mean, it means that there's one individual doing practically everything. You know, and yeah, yeah, that has. I mean, you you spend time addressing stakeholder engagement issues, you know, from when you're designing. So, I mean, it leaves little time for you to go back, you know, to that. So, so I'd say, you know, that, that, that's a major challenge. And, and if one can find a way to, to, to refine the process and get it, you know, done in such a way that, that it can be uh, a, a, a tool that, that can be re responsive, you know, to, to, challenges that are, that that um, emerge along the way then that would be good yeah i think the the developing of of developing guidance and training are important but then issues to do with 
you know, just making the capacity available to implement some of these tools is 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 key as well. Um, and some of some of them are it's possible to integrate them with what people are already doing without creating a lot of ad, sort of extra work. But uh, but 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 some of them, and depending on the on the on the the, the scope of the project, they're really heavy going. So preparing, say, a, a mitigation plan for say a um, a project funded by the Blue Action Fund, it requires a lot, a lot of work. Uh, it's it's just incredible amount of work that really sucks sucks uh, a lot of time. But yes, I mean, these things are important. It's just I'm just wondering how we can adjust the complexity of these tools to the reality of different organizations and the kinds of resources that they have available. So you, not not all organizations can do a BAF style process framework or BAF style uh, stakeholder engagement plan. Um, just looking at the chat here, um, there's a question, there's a comment here on FBIC. So I'm thinking here from a donor perspective, and I'm wondering how people ensure that free prior and informed consent is being properly applied and that implementing partners have the proper training to do so. And this is, yeah, this is a really important question. FBIC is obviously crucial, but then how you actually implement this on the ground is, is challenging. Who, who you need to speak to, um, how is consent actually given? How is it given? Is it given, you know, in community meetings? Who is it given by? Uh, how do you document it? Uh, those are some some key questions. Now, if anyone else has uh, any questions, you want to just unmute yourself and ask. Be really interested in hearing your views about how you've used some of these, or or or, or the kind of uh, challenges that you envisage when when planning to use some of these. So I can I can share something with you uh, at FFI in our in our plan to roll out social safeguards. These mechanisms that I've uh, listed. We our aim is that by 20 sort of by the end of this year, any new projects and what is a new project in FFI is often there are very few because of the way we define what a new project is, because we often work in areas where we've had a long presence. So a new project is sometimes just, you know, we can't really define it's 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 it might be just a new new fund, which is a, not a new project. So our plan is that until 2023, at the end of 2023, all new projects will include provisions to have these mechanisms in place, all of them, all of them. And by 2025, that all projects should have these social safeguards in place, all of these mechanisms where they're relevant to. And the only one that is not relevant to all projects is perhaps the uh, the ones that deal with ranges, so the, the code of conduct. All the other ones are pretty much applicable to most of the projects. Of course, the complexity of these will depend, obviously, with the type of project and kind of the level of risk involved. So it's a really ambitious, ambitious plan. So uh, we work with you. So you will be hearing a lot more about social safeguards in the next few years, and 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 we also see that a lot of new don a lot of donors are now requesting a very structured approach to social safeguards. It's not an option anymore, uh, and we want to be ready for that. Uh, so therefore, our ambitious plan to roll out social safeguards. A, a quick question: Does that mean that that I mean? resources will be allocated i mean uh, to, to addressing you know I mean, like... abs yeah absolutely so that, i think that is that is uh that is what must happen because a lot of these things cannot happen with resources uh, how we do that is you know the devil is in the detail isn't it uh and that in some in some uh projects it will be 
uh, possible to do that because it can be included. There are the funders already in, uh, allowed for the inclusion of that sort of uh, uh, of those resources for those sorts of things. For others, it's more yeah, it's more challenging. But what, uh, what will happen in practice is that we will, will be doing a lot of work in terms of developing guidance, templates, providing tailored support to partners to try to develop these things in the projects where these are most relevant and where there are actually conditions to do so. Any other questions or comments? Did I scare you with this with this very ambition ambitious plan to roll out social safeguards? Um, we had a comment in the chat from Juliana who said, thinking from the donor perspective, she's wondering how people ensure that FPIC, so free prior and informed consent, is being properly applied and that um, implementing partners have had the proper training to be able to apply it properly. I don't know if that's one for you, Sergio, or one for the, for the rest of the room. Yeah, um, if someone um, in, the, in the room has, has a good um, perspective on that, please do. What I said about FPIC is, uh, before is, is yeah, FPIC is, is one of those that it's very difficult to um, to provide sort of guidance that can be applied on on sort of a, a broader scale. So it's difficult to develop a template because FPIC is very, very context specific. And how you do consent in different cultural contexts is will be different. So you need to understand that first. Um, and then also how you doc document that is very, very, very important. Um, do you get everyone to sign, say yes? Um, do you, is it, is it oral? Um, do you take a photo of someone in a meeting? So you need to agree with, with stakeholders how the process is also going to doc be documented. So it's one of these, those ones that there are principles, but then those principles need to be adapted to context. I think we're out of time now. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, Sergio. <laughs> Um, for a fantastic webinar and thank you so much to our hardworking translators um, Alice and Floor um, who've been talking solidly as well for two hours um, and thanks to everybody for participating for coming along and for being such good sports about joining in um, so yeah thank you and hopefully see you at the next one Great. Thank you, Chloe. Thanks, everyone. And I hope to hear from you and work with you at some at some point. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Interesting. So. Thank you, Sergio. Thanks. And everyone, bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you.